protester tactics, all right, they have changed in the last few months on both ends of the spectrum. So instead of massive demonstrations, you know, the ones we've seen or, or clashes or things that are kind of choking off the streets in downtown Portland, we're seeing more of this. So the Oregonian reports about 50 protesters from the right wing group Patriot Prayer demonstrated yesterday at a single home in Silverton. The person who lived in that home is an Oregon workplace safety regular regulator and happened to be the very same person who fined a gym $90,000 for violating Governor Brown's two week freeze. Then on the other side of the aisle, we had this demonstration earlier this month at Portland Commissioner Dan Ryan's home. Left wing protesters, they weren't happy that Ryan voted against cutting more of the police budget, so they vandalized his house. They broke windows at his home. Not to mention, you know, all the cases of protests that we've seen kind of moving out of the downtown area and into neighborhoods, into residential places where families live. It got us wondering whether these kinds of targeted protesters, uh, protests rather, are effective for the cause or if they could eventually backfire. So I asked a guy who literally studies this stuff, PSU professor Dr. Mark Rodriguez. Here's some of our conversation. That's a, a tried and true tactic of protesters. Uh, going back to open housing protests in the 60s and uh, votes for women in the early 20th century, they often went to the houses of the people they wanted to convince to do something, right? Um, and I, so I think that's the kind of thing that, that has always been a part of protest culture. Uh, what's different is when somebody smashes a window or destroys property uh, on the site. Uh, and that's, I think, the kind of thing we saw at... Uh, uh, Mr. Ryan's house where he and his partner were pretty scared. Now, at that point, Dr. Rodriguez said that that is where it turns into something that's not normal. Uh, the vandalism and the damage, like we saw two weeks ago when protesters smashed windows up and down Sandy and Hawthorne in Portland. But he also says it's often counterproductive to what activists are trying to do for the cause. And he thinks it says something bigger about the state of these protest movements we're witnessing. Well, I think what it might be a sign of is the unraveling of the movement here in Portland. Uh, it doesn't seem to have the focus that it had during Black Lives Matter. It doesn't seem to have the focus that it had uh, during sort of what I would call anti-Trump protests. Now that Trump has, although he hasn't conceded, it's pretty clear he lost the election. And so I think that those kinds of things mean that on the, I would say, left or self-described progressive side of things, there's a little bit of a lack of clarity. Um, it's uncertain what they plan to do. And I think that most of the elected officials here in Portland support police reform. So it seems to me that they have perhaps one of the most progressive group of elected officials and protesting against them in this way that resorts to violence and the destruction of property probably is not going to help them very much. Explain to me why you think, and I'm sure it's based on your your viewings of the other, other protests in the past, but why do you think that th those little markers indicate that the movement could be losing steam here? Well, I think one of the things that I've always wondered about here in Portland was the degree to which these are autonomous movements without really clear leadership. There are certainly leaders. There are people that will speak to you as a leader, but we don't have the kind of coordinated effort. Uh, like I mentioned in the past, we didn't have, and we don't have the kind of self-policing. So for example, uh, when an elected official's home is picketed, uh, there's nobody there that seems to have the authority to tell people, please don't damage property. Um, and I think that we're now seeing that in the sort of scattered protests that don't seem to be part of a single narrative for reform. And that's, you know, to me, I think a result of the fact that leaderless movements are great at creating flash mobs. They're less effective at creating sustained narratives of protest over time. And Dr. Rodriguez explains it pretty simply how these violent protests can backfire on the demonstrators. For example, if protesters are targeting Mayor Wheeler, but they're also damaging his home, Neighbors who uh, may have been allies to the cause may not just be turned off by the tactics, but end up having sympathy for the mayor and his neighbors.